wa ni'mal wakil, ni'mal maula, wa ni'mal nasir Rabbi shrahli sadri, wa yassirli amri, wa halul uqadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ajraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen Khatim al-Nabiyyin, Shafi'i al-Mudhnibin Rahmatan lil-alameen, Mawlana wa Sayyidina Abil Qasim Muhammad Wa ala alihi al-tayyabin al-tahirin al-mahsubin al-muntajabin al-madlumin al-hudat al-mahfiyin لا سيما بقية الله في الأرض أرواحنا له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائه مجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب فقارن أهل الخير تكون منهم وباين أهل الشر تبين عنهم بر محمد وعلي محمد صلوات Yesterday we discussed some of the societal trends affecting our society What can happen is that individuals have got wrong views wrong criteria wrong practices and when these practices are found in a number of individuals together, they can become a societal norm and a societal trend. Slowly and surely that society becomes rotten, corrupt, goes in the wrong direction. We said that we should come up with some strategy or solutions to combat this. And I gave you four different solutions of how we as individuals can combat wrongful societal trends. The value which we extracted from this was that we should give more importance to the Akhirat than the world. If we start to do this, then we'll see that a lot of these societal trends will sort themselves out. Will society improve with one person stand? I don't think so. But will a family improve? Let's say you have a family of four or five. If one person all of a sudden becomes very good, very pious, adopts a otherworldly view rather than this worldly view, then can five people change? Yes. One of those five will be a student in university. Will he or she change another five? Yes. Those people will change another five? Yes. So slowly and surely, with one person changing, a lot of people can change. It's a domino effect. Of course, you'll think this guy is being very idealistic. I know I'm being idealistic. Islam is idealistic. When the Holy Prophet came, he didn't have an ideal in mind. When Imam al Islam came to power, he didn't have an ideal in mind. Of course they did. You have to be idealistic. If you are idealistic, you will get somewhere near the ideal. But if you are pessimistic, you will get nowhere near the ideal. So we have to be idealistic. It has to require some idealistic thinking in order to achieve this. Such people I termed yesterday as Azad Insan. Free people, free willed. In the past, what used to happen? was that when someone was not free, when someone was a slave, they had signs. How would you tell a person is a slave? Maybe he would be handcuffed. Maybe he would be shackled. Maybe he would have a rope around him being pulled here and there. Maybe he was made to crawl behind his master. The ridiculous thing is today, we are still slaves, but we drive Mercedes and BMWs and we wear suits. This is the only difference. Those signs are not there, but we are still slaves. What are we slaves to? Money, job, career, family, fame, fortune, whatever you want to call it, we are still slaves, unfortunately. So, Azad Insan is where we need to be. 
How do we achieve this with one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad? It needs sacrifice. I'm coming back to the same point that I made yesterday. It needs sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? It requires a few people to have guts, courage, bravery, and do certain things for which they will be very much condemned. People will judge them, but it requires guts. When you know for sure that you are on the true path, when you have checked your truth with all the other sources in our religion, you know you're not contravening Quran, you know you're not contravening Adul Bayt's way of life, you know you're not contravening intellect, you know you're not contravening the very well established, almost flawless system of the ulama that they have established, then you can be sure you're on truth. Then what do you do? You begin to sacrifice. Now what do we mean by sacrifice? So, some of the things we can do. We see for example, in the community, again, I don't know here, so don't say I'm talking about here. I'm talking about everywhere in the world. It could be here, you would know better than me. In the community, we often have a problem in marriages. <coughs> Marriages are done on a very grand scale, very lavish, very luxurious. Now, for a rich person to do this, there's no issue. He can afford it. What unfortunately will happen is a poor person will see and will say, I need to match that. If I don't match that, then what will people say? What will people think of me? So to match that, he'll go into debt and that, as you know, will eat him up and he won't be able to escape. So what sacrifice is needed? A few prominent, semi-prominent families get together and say, you know what? In the next shadi in our house, we're going to stick to a budget. Our budget is whatever. Come up with a modest budget that is maybe affordable on an average basis. Five families get together, three families get together, maybe you'll start with two families or one family. People will say, wow, they did it. We can do it. It's not such a taboo. It's not such a shame. Three, five, seven families get together and say, we will have a good hijabi gathering in our marriages. The rest will follow. It's tried and tested. So we can simplify our marriages. We can make a stand against injustices. How many times have we heard that this is not right in the community, that is not right in the community, this is not right in the community? My question is always, what are you doing about it? Oh, we can't do anything. So who do you expect to come? You expect Ibrahim to come down and solve your problems? You expect an angel to be sent? No. It has to start within the whole community. You can speak out against injustices, you can speak out against problems. You can let the leaders know what are the issues. You may be thinking this will not have any effect. If it's one or two, maybe. If it all of a sudden rises to 200 and 2,000 people, it will have an effect. We may need to patch up differences between our different groupings and factions in the community and start to create harmony and unity. Who will do this? Every individual is tasked to do this. Probably we can say it's wajib at kifahi. It's wajib on everybody. If a few people start, then it becomes sakit on the rest. These are some of the steps we need to take, inshallah, to relieve some of these societal pressures with the one salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. For tonight's discussion, we are going to discuss friendships and relationships. This is especially concerning our younger generation, those in school, college and university, those going into new places of work, that kind of age group, are fundamentally affected by these issues. Friendships 
and relationships. It's a very, very significant topic. The importance of friends cannot be doubted. Islam greatly emphasizes friendships. Islam wants us to make friends. Islam has greatly emphasized the need for friends. We still remember our childhood friends. If we ever meet them, we meet them with fondness. Because it's an age where the person is very innocent, is very clean-hearted. Those friendships also become quite clean-hearted and innocent. So when you meet those people later on, it's still got that air of cleanness, innocence and these kinds of things. If our friends are sporty, we become sporty. If our friends are studious, we become studious. If our friends are into music, we may get into music. If they're into drugs, God forbid we may get into drugs. If they're into alcohol, we may get into alcohol. If they are of a particular frame of mind, even in religious matters, they can influence either positively or negatively. If they're into ethics, we may become ethical. If they're into honor, we can become honorable. If they're generous, we'll become generous. It's a massive influence on each and every person, the people you gather with and the people you hang around with. Why? We have in psychology something called groupthink. Groupthink is a very dangerous thing, in my opinion. Because what happens is, Islam, as far as I can deduce, wants us to have a variety of experiences and choose the best and leave the worst. But when you get into a particular group, if the group is particularly very tight-knit, or if they have rules in the group especially, then that diversity cuts down and you've limited yourself to only group think. You start to think like the rest of the group. So a rich person, when he sometimes walks in a poor area, he can't believe it. It doesn't make sense to him. Why? This is reality. This is the majority of people in your city. But because he's always hung around rich people, he's into group, think he can't bear it or he can't accept it. And this is what tends to happen. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So my first point tonight is choosing a friend. What kind of friends to choose? This is both to youngsters who are listening and also to parents of youngsters who should supervise the types of friends your children have. The hadith is from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah quotes an incident from the life of Nabi Isa. He says, the companions, the disciples, asked Isa, Ya Ruhullah, as you know, as Isa's name was, Ruhullah, one of the titles. Ya Ruhullah, man nujalis. Who should we hang around with? Who should we befriend? He replied, May you dhakkirukumullah. Someone who, when you see him, reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His look, just looking at him. وَيَزِيدُ فِي عِلْمِكُمْ مَنْ And when he speaks, he increases your knowledge. He says beneficial things. He says things that are logical. They make sense. They're in line with reality. They're in line with Islam. And his action is such that whatever he does makes you keen on akhirat. His amal, his action, makes you also keen for akhirat. That is one basis of friendship. These three things should be there in a friend. Now, how much attention are we giving whom our children are befriending? How much attention are we giving to whom sometimes we are befriending? Things can happen, things can rub off, practices can be transferred, habits can be picked up. We need to be very, very careful of this point. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Oh, 
brief discussion on how to choose a friend. Now we come on to a societal issue related to this topic. What we often find is that a great obstacle in choosing a friend and in hanging around with a friend, the obstacle is what does society think? So society thinks that everyone, the pressure is that everyone should be in a certain way. In boys, I guess we can say society wants our young boys to be very macho, strong, maybe sporty, maybe a little bit aggressive, maybe a little bit stubborn, maybe very flashy with the latest shining things, gadgets, maybe very streetwise in the way he talks. What does it expect of our girls? Our girls should be stunningly beautiful, they should be thin, they should be fair, their body should be in a certain way, their faces should be in a certain way. So society has pressures. Once you don't conform to that ideal, you are prone to lots of things. Number one, you are prone to bullying, criticism, taunts. All of these things tend to happen. So there's a lot of pressure on our youngsters. Now, has Islam provided us with a framework or a system of how to deal with the expectations of others, whether you're young or old? Even old people are not exempt from this. Has Islam given us a way to deal with it? Let us see with one salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is a very delicate issue. It requires a little bit of thought. What I've noticed is, in the West, there is a certain attitude in the culture. The attitude is, I am what I am. Take it or leave it. I am not going to change. I don't care what you think about me, and you don't care what I think about you, I am what I am. I've even been to houses of people where they say, for example, they become a little bit embarrassed. God bless them. They become a little bit embarrassed. So if their child comes in front and he looks a certain way, or if the daughter is not wearing hijab, they'll say, oh, you know, my son, he doesn't do taklid, or he doesn't pray, or he doesn't come to mosque, but you know, he's so truthful, he is what he is. He doesn't care what people think. Somehow that parent, Bichara, is trying to cloud the feeling, trying to make an excuse, trying to make his heart, like, accept the situation. They love less them. They are clean-hearted people. I want you to examine this. What does Islam say about I am what I am? What you see is what you get. I'm not going to put on any false pretense for any person. What does Islam say about this? So Islam says, when you have this attitude, there is one big advantage. In such a society, Riyakari is reduced. Because you don't care generally what other people think, it's not a culture of showing off. Generally speaking, I'm making a very broad statement here. Generally speaking, it's not a culture where people show up. Okay? What about our cultures? Whether here or in the West. I'm talking about traditional Eastern, which have been mixed with Muslim values, these kinds of cultures. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We are very much opposite. We really emphasize how people look at us. We greatly care what people think. We need our children, when people come to our home, we tell our children to act in a certain way. In public, to act in a certain way. Certain things we will never wear in public. Certain behaviors we will never show in public. 
advantage is that we have haya, sharam, some kind of feeling of modesty, excellent. In the other culture, believe me, they could do anything you can think of in front of their own parents, no one cares. There is an absence of haya. But the disadvantage is, there is a tendency to show off, to do things just to show others. So riyakari increases. So neither is absolutely perfect. We're going to try and define what should be the perfect mode of operation in this. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So should we be bothered by what people think? Should we be bothered by expectations of people? How do we handle these expectations of people? Let me put it into a framework for you. We start off with a hadith by Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam. His hadith is this. See what you think about this. Be wary of going to places of ill repute. Be wary of going to places of ill repute where your reputation may be questioned. Imam discourages people to go to places no matter what their intention, but he's saying in general be wary because if someone sees you go to this kind of place, your reputation will be affected. Reputation and honor of a mu'min is very, very high in Islam. Very high. So much so that we are told even if you are near the Kaaba, it is more important for you to honor a mu'min than go and rush and push people and give people elbows and knees and reach the Kaaba. Big difference in understanding of religion when you come to these kinds of things. A lower understanding of religion would say what? I paid $4,000 for this Hajj trip. I'm going to get my $4,000 worth of sawab. Whatever happens, I'm going to push people, shove people. I will reach the black stone. I will reach the tower. Higher level of Islamic understanding says, honor of a mu'min is more important than reaching the Kaaba. So, Imam says, a mu'min's honor, your own honor, my honor, our honor is very important. Don't do things that spoil your honor. Who judges honor? People. Now I'm going to build a framework for you. So, the question is, should we care what people think? Should we be bothered by people's opinions? Some people say, I don't give a damn what people think. I know I'm right. Other people say, no, I will not do the right thing because of what people think. If I do this right thing, what will people say? Someone is doing gibat with me. If I say to him, please, brother, stop talking. This is gibat. What will he think of me? So we do haram to please. We stop doing haq to please. Very dangerous situation, man. We need to clarify this very well. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa The first principle, there are four principles. The first principle is the primary concern of every mu'min should be Allah's opinion about him or her. Primary concern. First and foremost, the first step you ask is what will Allah think of this situation? Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Does insan not realize that Allah is watching? That feeling of watching. Khawfe khuda, fear of God, taqwa, piety. This is what we're talking about. So the first and foremost opinion of any of us, of any mu'min is, what does my Lord think? That is the most important opinion that matters. That's step number one. However, 
what if he can please Allah? He doesn't contradict the laws of God. He's not doing anything haram. And he can also please people. Which is better, to please Allah and displease people, or to please Allah and please people? Of course, logic tells us you please Allah and you also please people as well. So for example, someone is doing kibbutz to you. You have a number of ways of reacting. You ask yourself, should I stop him or not? 99.99% you will say, I will stop him. Why? Because it pleases Allah. Allah is displeased if I hear kibbutz. You've got two ways of stopping him. You want to give him a tamata? Or you want to explain to him nicely? You explain to him nicely. You don't offend him as much as possible. And you please Allah and you please him as well. Not please him, but you know what I mean. You don't upset him. So that's the first step in this framework. Is pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our main concern. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa Second step is pleasing Ahlul Bayt. Is there a difference between pleasing Allah and pleasing Ahlul Bayt? No. Essentially, no. Essentially, there's no difference. If Allah is pleased with you, Ahlul Bayt will be pleased with you. If Ahlul Bayt are pleased with you, Allah will be pleased with you. That we can guarantee. Why? Because Quran says, وَمَا يَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ That their will and Allah's will are joined kind of thing. So, why are we putting this into a separate category? We are putting it into a separate category because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us Ahlul Bayt and has given us the zikr of Ahlul Bayt for a very good reason. Right now, if I were to ask you, Sometimes when we're at home or office or anywhere, if at that moment Imam Zamana would enter that room or home or office, would you act, think and feel in the same way? Or would you quickly change? Undoubtedly you would quickly change. Undoubtedly you would have so much awe an inspiration of this great man, you would quickly purify your thoughts, your feelings and everything. But Allah was there even before Imam Zamana walked in. So sometimes it is effective to think of Ahlul Bayt. Not as independence to God, but as in line with God. We have a horizontal and a vertical. I don't want to make it very complicated, it's a slightly philosophical concept. We don't see Ahlul Bayt as horizontal to Allah, that either we choose Prophet or Allah or Imam Hussein. We, say, we see them in a vertical line. It's all one, it's in the same channel. So Quran says, Do your actions, Allah sees your actions, His Prophet sees your actions, Wal Mu'minun and the Mu'mineen see your actions. Why does Allah mention separately? Allah sees your actions. Prophet sees your actions. Of course, if Prophet sees, then Allah sees. Allah sees everything. But Allah says no. Sometimes it's effective on a human being to think of Ahlul Bayt as well. Sometimes when we think, if Bibi Fatima was watching me now, what would she think? It has an effect, isn't it? Allah was there before. Allah is always there. Sometimes we think, if Mawla Ali could see me now, what would he think? I've been on ziyarah trips where in Najaf, a person in my group could not enter the haram. He refused. For three days we were in Najaf. He just sat at the door. He wouldn't go in. We pleaded with him. We said, what's wrong? You've gone, you've come thousands of miles to Najaf 
Go to the Zari. He says, I can't face him. I can't. It has an effect. So, second step of this framework is keep Ahlul Bayt in mind as well. Keep your Imam Zamana in mind. Think about him looking at you. Think about him receiving reports about you. Let me say something about the reports with the Sawaat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We believe that Imam Zamana has an overall general awareness of our situation and our actions. Then we have hadith which say twice a week, twice a week, he is given formal reports about each and every one of his Shias. What we do, what we don't do, what we miss, what we did, how we thought, what we said. He's given these reports. If he sees something good, he becomes happy. If he sees something bad, he becomes upset. So he knows. So start to think as well as Allah that your Imam is also watching you. Again, let me stress, I'm not putting Imam independent to Allah. I'm putting him in the same line of thought as our Lord. Thirdly, third part of this framework. With one salawat once again, please. Mu'mineen. Are Mu'mineen important? Does it matter what Mu'mineen think? Very delicate subject. Really sensitive subject. Does it matter what Mu'mineen think? According to the verse I just recited, yes. It says Allah sees your actions. Rasulullah sees your actions. Mu'mineen see your actions. Now what does this mean? Here we need to be very strict on our criteria of Mu'min. What do we mean by Mu'min here? We don't mean just anyone who believes. We mean Mu'mineen who are pious, who know a good deal of religion, who can somehow act as a yardstick for us in our deeds and actions. Somehow, in the period of Ghaybat, Mu'mineen are a yardstick for our actions. They somehow represent the view of Islam. Now, what do I mean by this? One Mu'min can make a mistake. Two Mu'mineen can make a mistake. Three can make a mistake. When you have a group, a bunch of Mu'mineen, who have a good understanding of Islam, who have a fear of God, if they tell you, something is wrong, then you should take that on board. That is a yardstick for you. It's not just good enough to say, what do they know? They're not masoom. No. Quran mentions them. Quran mentions them very clearly. Our hadith mentions them. Mu'mineen are important. Now, this does not mean we do things to please Mu'mineen. We please only Allah. But at the same time, if we can avoid upsetting people in the process, that is very important. Please Allah, be warm with mu'mineen. Use mu'mineen as your yardstick. You are not perfect. I am not perfect. Sometimes we need to ask people, what do you think of this? What do you think of two couples going out together? What do you think of one husband of one and the wife of another talking without any restrictions, laughing, joking? What do you think of that? What do you think of such parties? What do you think of such gatherings? What do you think of such weddings? Is it good? Do you think I should go? What do you think of this music? Is it halal, haram? Ask them. Seek their counsel. But remember what I'm saying. Mu'mineen has a criteria. Taqwa. Adalat. Adalat we're going to discuss more tomorrow. Taqwa. Adalat. Justice. Piety. Deen shanasi. Knowing religion. Khawf e khuda being fearful of the Lord. These are the criteria of a movement. Measure yourself sometimes. It's very interesting. You'll find a great deal of counsel from sincere movement, inshallah. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa Fourth step of our 
framework is other people, non mobili important to please them or not? Absolutely yes. In line with the previous three. First priority, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second priority, Ahlul Bayt. Not second priority, but you, you know what I mean. Second step. Third step, Mumini has a gate and a yardstick. Other people, should we just continue our lives in a way that we ignore the surroundings around us? Absolutely not. Islam says as long as you can live in harmony, you live. When there is an issue of extreme, haqqan batil, halal haram, then there's no compromise, I'm sorry. But until that stage comes, we be warm with those around us. We show akhlaq, we show warmth, we show forgiveness, we show welcoming. We have to be very, very careful of these things. These are the framework which I wanted to uh, present to you with one salawat ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa alayhi wa The next issue which I wanted to discuss is again coming back to friendships and relationships. So we've discussed a little bit of how to choose a friend. Then we've just discussed about how to deal with judgments and expectations of others. Now we come on to a discussion where for the next generation it's going to be fundamental. Probably I haven't experienced this in my life. Probably the majority of you in this hall and the mosque have not experienced it in your lives. That is the reality, whether it's sad or happy, you can decide. The reality that the majority of the relationships of the next generation are going to be online. Friendship will be online, communication will be online, chatting will be online. God knows, I think we're already at a stage where marriage proposals are all, on, uh, are all online. It seems now you can order a bride or a husband from God knows where. Everything of this kind of thing is going online and it's going to be more and more. Now, this represents a lot of opportunity. We like technology, we're not anti-technology, but let us look at some of the independent research studies done on this subject. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa alayhi Let me stress, this is not an expert study. I turned on my laptop, I opened Google, I typed in a few words, I pressed return. That's it. This is what I found. March 2016, independent newspaper, headline, heavy social media users trapped in endless cycle of depression. Data, the more time young adults spend on social media, the more likely they are to become depressed. Fact. One example he cited was a phenomenon which is sometimes referred to as Facebook depression, in quotes. He says, this is the expert, people who engage in a lot of social media may feel they are not living to the idealized portraits of life that other people tend to present in their profiles. You see someone happy, you think, why am I not happy? You see someone with a beautiful spouse, you think, why is my spouse not like that? You see someone with idealized children. Why are my kids not like that? This would be concerning. It would imply a vicious circle. People who become depressed turn to social media for support. But their excessive engagement with social media may only serve to exacerbate their depression. Increase their, their depression. Second thing, September 2015, Guardian newspaper. This is from a girl who is in her teens. She has a younger sister who is 14. I didn't take the age of this girl. Let's assume 16, 17. She says there are so many social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Tumblr, you name it. I made a conscious decision to avoid Snapchat and Instagram because of the social pressure I saw it putting on my 14-year-old little sister. If my mom turned off the Wi-Fi at 11 p.m., my sister would beg me to turn my phone into a hotspot. She always needed to load her Snapchat stories one more time, 
or to reply to a message that had come in two minutes ago because if she didn't, her friend would feel ignored. If I refused, saying that she could respond in the morning when the Wi-Fi was on, I would get the, you're ruining my social life speech. You want more facts? A new study has found that teenagers who engage with social media during the night are damaging their sleep and increasing their risk of anxiety and depression. Teenagers felt pressured to make themselves available 24-7. The resulting anxiety did not respond. The resulting anxiety was because they did not respond immediately to texts or posts. Girls are likely to experience more stress more often than boys, on average twice a week. It's becoming more and more obvious how the pressures of social media affect girls disproportionately. I can see it all around me, pressure to be perfect, to look perfect, act perfect, have the perfect body, have the perfect group of friends, perfect amount of likes on Instagram, perfect, perfect, perfect. And if you don't meet these ridiculously high standards, then self-loathing and bullying begins. We're seeing more and more the rise of self-harm, cutting, bulimia, starvation. All of these things are happening. Now, I don't know what it's going to take for us to change. God forbid, will it take a serious case of depression? Will it take serious anxiety issues? God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, I wish this never ever happens to any community in the world. Will it take a suicide to wake us up? What is going to happen? What needs to happen? Article on Forbes, April 2015, with one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This is very interesting. This has a psychological angle. Forbes did an article. What they said was, that previously the experts thought that looking at people who are socially lower than you made you feel good and looking at people who are socially higher than you made you feel bad. So you go on Facebook or you go online to any of these platforms, you have a 50-50 chance, isn't it? Some people will be socially better, some people will be socially worse. So sometimes Pushy, sometimes round, if you know what I mean. So you have a 50-50 chance, right? They did a new survey, they did a new study. They said actually it turned out that people who logged more Facebook time, not only did they have increased depression, but in fact, looking at profiles in any direction was a factor in increased depression for both genders. Somehow, it seems odd. I would have said, yeah, if I look at someone below me, it makes me happy. But somehow they found out. Both directions somehow creates anxiety. Maybe that inner human feeling, when you see someone who is not in as uh, nice position as you, you feel something inside, isn't it? Maybe it's that, I don't know. Now, how do we handle this? I have three ideas at the moment. You have probably many more. Let us discuss these quickly with the salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Three ideas that can be immediately implemented, I think, by individuals and individual families. First one, God forbid, switch off the smartphone difficult, isn't it? I don't know how many months it's been, sometimes people don't switch off their smartphone. Switch it off. Relieve yourself of that shackle. Have trust in Allah. Switch it off. Number one. Number two. If you have children, have a dedicated place in the home where after a certain time, eight, nine, ten, eleven, whatever, depending on your lifestyle, after a certain time, all the gadgets, tablets, phones, laptops go into this one dedicated place. My friend uses his dining table. It's downstairs, bedrooms are upstairs. Kids know that at a certain time, 
everything without fail goes onto the kitchen table. Everyone comes, puts their gadgets and goes. He's chosen a time. You can choose your own time depending on your own lifestyle. Not giving the smartphone until absolutely necessary. What age that is, again, you'll decide. The method that I would recommend is that you allow the child to build trust before you give that gadget over. And if the trust is broken, the gadget is lost. Why is driving only permissible after a certain age? Why is voting only permissible? Because it's all about maturity and trust of making the right decision. We are fools if we place these gadgets in the hands of our children too early. Really, we are not doing us and our families and our children any favors. That was on the individual level. Now we discuss a little bit on the social level with one salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Two things which I've noticed. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, please correct me. This is my humble observation. Two things seem to be lacking over here. Number one is a uniform, organized, well-run madrasa. There may be. If I'm wrong, forgive me. But I'm saying en masse, in general, this doesn't seem to be the case. This is very fundamental. This is critical. Why? Number one, not only is it good for information, children will receive information. Number two, it builds their lifelong friends. Right now in London, nine out of ten people hang around the same Ishnashri Shia friends that they had during their madrasa years. Really good system. Now I'm not saying everyone is perfect, I'm not saying everyone is good. At least you have that small amount of comfort that they share a few values, they share a little bit of heritage, they will respect Mahi Ramzan, they will respect Muharram, they will pray. At least there's that. Number two, what I call, we were discussing a few days ago with a few brothers, the importance of social clubs halal social clubs for kids. For example, in London, I'm not saying London is perfect by a long way, one of the things we have done is we have clubbed together and we've made a sports club. Call it Jafaris. It handles lots of different things. One of them is sports. Which youngster doesn't love sports? They're all crazy about sports. Again, what happens? Who comes for the kids' birthday parties? The Shia, Mohmedin's kids who come to sports. Who are their friends growing up? Same. Who are their buddies in their adulthood? Same. It creates bonds. We need to start at that early age. Now, it's a big task. I'm not saying it's an easy job. My role is to kind of suggest. If it's doable, alhamdulillah. If it's not doable, I'm sure you'll find a way. We pray to Allah for tawfiq, for a guiding light. There's nothing that is beyond Allah. Even if we feel it's beyond us, it's not beyond Him. Let us pray for our tawfiq with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. O oh, Hussein, we bid you salams. We are nearing the tragic day of Ashura in which our gum, our sorrow, our mourning will reach a peak. Slowly and surely we are building up to that. We are remembering now the Ahlul Bayt of Imam Hussein, the close and dear loved ones of Imam Hussein. Yesterday we remembered Hazrat Qasim. Today we are going to remember a personality that is best known for his loyalty, his bravery, his strength and his sacrifice. Hazrat Abbas was born 26 AH. Mawla Ali passes away, is made shaheed by the accursed Ibn Muljim in 40 AH, thus making Hazrat Abbas 14 years old. 
The difference in age between Janab Abbas and Imam Hussein was 22 years. His mother's name was Fatima, known better as Ummul Baneen because of her four sons. In some reports in history we read that when Hazrat Abbas was still a baby, Mola would come and kiss the arms of Hazrat Abbas. Bibi Umul Baneen would come and ask, why do you kiss the arms? His eyes would swell with tears. He would say, one day this son of mine is going to lose his arms for the love of his brother. This we find in some reports. <coughs> Mawla had an intense love for Hazrat Abbas. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein were known as the children of the Holy Prophet because they were so close to the Holy Prophet People called them sons of Holy Prophet. Hazrat Abbas was of course the son of Mawla and recognized as such. Mawla says regarding Hazrat Abbas, Abbas zukka al-ilm zakka. Abbas is so knowledgeable. He has been fed knowledge like a bird feeds its own young ones. That is how Mawla trained made knowledgeable this great personality of Hazrat Abbas. When you remember his bravery, we should not forget his knowledge and his mahfad and his ilm. Throughout the life of Imam Hassan, Mu'afiyah tried a lot to separate somehow Abbas from Ahlul Bayt. Abbas was never falling into these traps. Abbas shows ultimate loyalty, ultimate sacrifice. Ashab have been killed. Many of the Ahlul Bayt have been killed. Many people ask that why did Janabi Abbas wait for so long before going out and being Shaheed? Was he not keen? Brothers and sisters, Abbas was very keen. Hussein was not keen to lose Janabi Abbas. Why? Bibi Zainab always had a hope as long as Abbas was present. She says, and the history says, that Janab Zainab, at one point, she says, when Abbas comes to her to bid farewell, Janab Zainab says, Oh brother, now I understand something which my father said. <laughs> Abbas says, yes sister, what is that? She says, when father was leaving this world, he told me to have supper on the day when I will be tied by a rope. I thought to myself, how is it possible that a sister who has a brother like Abbas can be in this situation? A sister who has 18 brothers, how can it be that she will be in that situation? Abbas, alayhi salam, comes to Imam Hussein, Ya Mawla, oh my master, do you grant me permission to go? Imam would say, no Abbas, I need you, I need you with me. Finally, when there is hardly anyone left, Janab Abbas comes to Imam Hussein and says, Mawla, I will not fight. Allow me to go for one reason. He says, what reason? He says, Sakina keeps on requesting me to fetch her some water. For this reason, let me go. Imam reluctantly, with a heavy heart, allows Janab Abbas to go. Imam says, you are to bring the water and return to us. Abbas rides out into Karbala. Enemy said, this looks like Ali ibn Abi Talib has come to the Maidan of Karbala. Abbas rides. He is able to pass by lots of the battalions of the army of Umar Esad. He reaches the river. As he reaches the river, they say that he puts down his water skin to fill the water. As he puts down his water skin, they say that he looks towards the tents. It is said that maybe Abbas paused at that moment 
because he sees Sakina at the door of the tent telling the children, my uncle has got water, soon water will reach us. Janab Abbas takes the water and puts it into one hand. Umar Asad now sees what Janab Abbas is trying to do. He tells the army, everybody rush towards Abbas. Do not let him return back to the tents. Abbas places the water in one hand. The cowards come, they fight him, they chop that arm, the arm falls. Abbas shouts out, if you chop one arm, I have the other arm. He transfers the skin into the other arm. They say the other arm is chopped. He is able to take the water skin in his teeth. He is riding towards Sakina and then the arrow is thrown. The arrow hits Janab Abbas into the eye. He begins to struggle upon the horse. He falls from the horse. One of the Maktal reciters, they said that for Abbas, there is a huge difference in his shahadat. Why? Because every Shaheed who fell was able to support himself with his arms, but not Janab Abbas. He had no arms. He falls straight onto the sands of Karbala. Ya Mawla, adrik me. Oh my master, come to me. Janab Imam Hussein rushes towards Abbas. In Farsi, they recite it like this. They recite it that Abbas must have felt, Oh my Imam, every time you enter in my presence, I stand up for your respect. Abbas cannot stand up today. Oh my Imam, every time I was upset, I would hug you, I would cradle you in my arms. Today Abbas does not have arms. Oh my brother, oh my Mola, every time Abbas would feel upset, he would look at your face. Today one arrow is in one eye, the other eye is full of the blood. Oh Imam, Imam comes down, puts Abbas's head into his lap. He bids him farewell. And then what does the Rawi say? The Rawi says that up until that point, Hussein looked like a young man in Karbala. After Abbas was killed, Imam gets up, his back is bent, he looks old, Imam cries out, Allah in Qasr now my back is broken, Abbas has gone. Allah <laughs> وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مَنْ قَلِبِهِمْ قَلِبُونَ فَارِئِ إِلَاهَا Oh Allah, just one dua for tonight. Our obstacles are great, our challenges are immense. Give us the bravery, courage and loyalty of Janabi Abbas. Let us remember all Marhumim with Al-Fatiha.